Good morning, everyone. My name is Nina Murray, and I am Head of Policy and Research at the European Network on Statelessness. It's a pleasure to welcome you today on behalf of ENS to our webinar, Closing Protection Gaps, Addressing Statelessness in Europe. For those of you not familiar with ENS, we're a civil society alliance of over 150 organizations and individual experts working to address statelessness in about 40 countries across Europe. And we do this through law and policy development, awareness raising and capacity building. We are really excited today to have had more than 300 registrations for today's webinar. Um, please say hello in the chat. Feel free to tell us who you are, where you are and your organization or, or what you do. We're also going to post a quick poll in the, um, in the webinar platform. So if you could answer the poll when you get a minute, that would be great. We just want to find out a little bit more about who's with us today. I can see already that we have more than 100 people online live with us now. Um, I can see some poll results coming in already. So people are saying they have some knowledge of statelessness, um, sufficient knowledge to address statelessness in your work. Um, just over 60% are saying yes to some extent, um, a few saying yes definitely, and a few sort of not really or not at all. So um, it's good to know that we have some different levels of awareness joining us today. So this is the first in a series of webinars that we're organising over the next few weeks with uh, our, one of our members in Spain, Fundación Cepaim. Um, following the postponement of our regional conference in Alicante earlier this year. So you can register for the other webinars in the series, which will be in Spanish, so for Spanish speakers only, I'm afraid, and they will focus on statelessness in the Spanish context. And in a moment when the poll has finished, we'll put the, um, the registration link in the chat so that you can register. So uh, in these challenging times, it's really inspiring to see so many people join us and take an interest in the important issues that we're going to be talking about today. Thank you very much um, for taking the time out of your busy days to hear from our exciting lineup of speakers and to learn more about statelessness in Europe. We hope that you'll all stay engaged in our and their work um, after today's session. Um, but before I tell you a bit more about the session today, I just want to go through some quick housekeeping points. So uh, you'll see on the slide, we're recording the session today. So we'll make it available afterwards publicly so you can share it afterwards with colleagues who can't make it today. The participant names and the chat are not visible in the recording, so don't worry about that. Participant microphones are all switched off and cameras. Um, please use the chat function though, that's there for you to ask questions, to connect with us as we go through the webinar. And we'll be collating the questions that you ask during the sessions um, and putting some of them to our speakers at the end during the question and answer. Feel free also to email us afterwards if we are not able to answer your question if we don't have time. So today's webinar, the aim of the webinar is to assess the current situation facing stateless people in Europe and to showcase some of the work being done across Europe by our members, by activists and community-led organisations in particular, and to facilitate a shared online space where representatives of community organisations can um, and state and decision makers and NGOs can contribute their ideas and suggestions for the way forward. So you'll see from the agenda slide that we're going to hear first from our director, Chris Nash, who's going to reflect on some of the current uh, work and context in Europe. Then we'll hear from four of our members who will showcase their work. And then this will be followed by interventions from representatives of European institutions. And then at the end, there'll be some time for questions, hopefully. So as I said, please get your questions ready and post those in the chat. Before I hand over though to our first speaker, um, I see that we've already got lots of um, hellos coming in in the chat from lots of people from Spain, from Sweden, um, from where else have we got? Lots of exciting places there already. So thanks for joining us, Czech Republic. Good morning, hello everyone. So before I hand over to our first speaker, we're really excited to show you a short video which has been produced in collaboration with ENS members and stateless activists 
Over the last two years, ENS has been working increasingly alongside communities and stateless activists to make sure that policy and decision-making processes are accountable and involve stateless people. So here's why, and tune into this video. It's like a dustbin and nobody cares about you. Every aspect of what it means to be a human being stripped away from oneself Kind of means uh, no freedom, no human rights. It starts as a child when you kind of realize that for some reason nobody really wants you. You're you're nothing. You are dead. It's a certain feeling of not belonging anywhere. You can't be at home anywhere. To be stateless, you know. Uh... Statelessness is non-existence. You know, you're a non-person, you are, you doesn't exist. You're simply stuck and pretty helpless in a place which is very ignorant to the fact that you need help and support to get out of a situation that you didn't even create for yourself. The nationality is a gateway for your dreams. Without having nationality, you will lose all your basic rights. You don't have equal rights. What are my rights? It's inhuman, I can say that. No one in the world should just be here without belonging to a community, without belonging to a nation. We should be cooperating with each other to overcome the issue of statelessness. We as individuals, we are as institutions, we as our governments. Everybody has to be uh, the citizen of uh, this beautiful world. Not belonging to a country shouldn't determine whether I am allowed to travel, whether I am allowed to open a bank account, whether I am allowed to go to school. We shouldn't have to worry about tomorrow because of our uh, statelessness. I would like to see Europe uh, without any stateless people in it. For sure. Within five years' time, we don't want to see any stateless person in Europe. Stateless people are part of this world, and you know they they deserve to to participate and to be useful. I feel like what the needs of the stateless person are are being excluded. They're not being heard adequately, if at all. It is very important the decision maker uh, will be able to understand from the point of view of the stateless people the struggle they face and the freedom they do not have. Problems can't be solved by the same systems that created those problems, but they need other ways of thinking you can't build a policy from behind a desk. Work face to face with a human that is stateless. Go down to the grassroots level and build a connection with these stateless people because I can guarantee you they're yearning to get involved in the decision making. They want to get involved in the discussion. Reach out to communities, reach out, reach out to different networks. Look them in the face and tell them like the the decision you're making right now will affect my life and hundreds of thousands of people like me. Including these people, you have more heads, more thinking heads, no more ideas. And uh, that's the most important thing. It's not your issue, it's their issue. So like, listen to them. Decision makers or people who are in a position of doing so, they should promote harmony and love and creating spaces of people coming together. One of my dreams is to visit uh, as many places as I can in my lifetime.
I think the video speaks for itself. Um, you'll hear more from two of its stars shortly. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, who is ENS Director Chris Nash. Chris, over to you. Thanks, Zena. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's just over eight years since I and a few others set up ENS, but watching the video just now, I was really struck by how far we've come as a network. As back then, we simply didn't have these powerful voices so directly informing and driving our work. And it's clearly essential that stateless people are heard in the decision-making processes that affect their lives if together we are to achieve the transformative change that we are seeking. We'll hear more from Lynn and Christiana in a moment, but in the short time I have available, I want to give a very quick overview of what we've been able to achieve as a network, but perhaps more importantly, what still remains to be done. Motivated by a lack of uh, awareness of statelessness, we've run several uh, successful awareness raising campaigns, including to better mainstream statelessness in policy agendas such as child rights, minority rights and refugee rights. Using the multiplier effect of our membership, we've also been able to get the issue higher up the agenda of EU institutions. For example, our Stateless Kids campaign helped secure the first dedicated hearing on statelessness by the European Parliament. It also helped secure a new initiative on statelessness by the Council of Europe, which hopefully Christophe Perel will say a few words about later. Increased awareness generated through our campaigns has also helped create political space, which we have worked in with our members to help achieve uh, concrete law and policy reform at country level to improve the situation of stateless people on the grounds. For example, Norway uh, has improved its safeguards to prevent childhood statelessness. Last year, Bulgaria improved legislation to better protect stateless people. And earlier this summer, Ukraine became the latest European country to adopt a stateless determination procedure. Underpinning all our advocacy is our statelessness index, a benchmarking and monitoring tool which now covers law policy and practice in 24 European countries. We and our members have also worked to support advocacy under UNHCR's I Belong campaign, which saw around 300 pledges made at the high level segment on statelessness last year. So we can collectively be proud of this process, progress, but equally uh, we need to recognize that the pace of reform is much too slow for the more than half a million men, women and children still living without a nationality in Europe today. In, in terms of key protection gaps which remain, you know, one persisting failure is one of identification. In order to, for stateless people to be able to realize, realize their rights, states first need to, they first need to be identified. And currently only 10 European states have functioning determination procedures to identify stateless people. This is despite the fact that all but three member states have ratified the 1954 convention and it's more than 70 years since this convention was adopted. We cannot be waiting many more decades to rectify this. Europe also continues to be a producer of statelessness, yet this could easily be solved if all countries lived up the, to their international obligation to grant nationality to children born on their territory who would otherwise be stateless. Yet currently only half of European states are ensuring this. A toxic combination of anti-gypsyism and technical barriers to birth registration is also perpetuating statelessness among minority populations such as the Roma. Statelessness very much continues to be both a minority and a gendered issue. This is why it's so important that in the forthcoming EU post 2020 uh, Roma integration framework, as well as the forthcoming EU child's rights strategy, statelessness needs to be a priority issue. Children born stateless in Europe are not only denied their right to a nationality, but they are also denied the future possibility to participate as EU citizens. This is why the EU cannot continue to ignore this issue. Equally, the EU, EU cannot ignore the 
particular protections of stateless people in its migration response, as we know that tens of thousands of asylum seekers arriving in Europe each year are either stateless or of unknown nationality. But despite our best efforts, we are not confident that tomorrow, when the Asylum and Migration Pact is published, that it will include significant action to addressing statelessness. Another reason why governments and EU institutions and European institutions need to show more urgency in, in recognizing and upholding rights to stateless people is the critical importance of the um, of ensuring universal access to health care in these current times of pandemic. COVID-19 is going to impact disproportionately on minority and marginalized and discriminated populations such as the stateless. And this is why we all need to show more urgency in addressing this, despite the operational challenges that I know we're all facing. I think my time is about up, so I will end on a short but positive note to reiterate that we can end statelessness but we cannot do it without the people affected by it and together we must demand of governments that they show more urgency and greater political will as well as advocate for a much more concerted pan-regional strategy thank you that's great that's great we're now going to hear from four ENS members who are themselves stateless activists or representatives of communities and populations affected by statelessness across Europe. So first up, we have Christiana, Christiana Bucalo, who is a stateless person living in Germany. And Christiana, encouraged by the goal of creating um, community between stateless people and their allies, Christiana started um, an initiative to build a digital platform, an online forum that's focused solely on statelessness. So we're looking forward to hearing more about this. Christiana, over to you. Thank you, Nina, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. Um, before I share with you what exactly my project is about, I want to share one of the struggles I was facing in the last couple of weeks leading up to this presentation. So up until two weeks ago, my presentation, my participation in this webinar were promoted under a different name. Different name means that I had decided to use a pen name instead of my real name in order to kind of protect my actual real identity. Um, that was because I was scared what might happen if I chose to do what I am planning to do on the basis of my true identity. What I was scared of was um, of potentially being discriminated. I was scared of maybe having to expose too much about my personal life and other things. But I have to admit that the thing I was most scared of actually was that I might potentially annoy um, the government or people in positions of power. So I was scared that I might upset people um, in positions of power in a way that this might lead to them at some point, maybe even diminishing the slight um, chance that me and my family still have to at some point maybe peacefully set foot in Germany. And that was not because what I'm intending to do is um, inappropriate or in some way illegal, but it was mainly because Myself, me as a stateless person, I just wasn't sure whether I could trust that the government and policymakers actually want to work on statelessness and care for the topic. However, the project is actually pretty simple and it also only has the best intention. Um, as a person that has been living as a stateless person since uh, being born in Germany, I was getting more and more frustrated with the lack of information and the lack of knowledge about the topic. So at some point, about one year ago, I decided to actually do something about it. And I had set this mission for myself to find one single source of truth. And my goal was actually to find a single source of truth and help that source of truth to choose to distribute the information to people who really needed it, to stateless people. And um, the thing is, I unfortunately couldn't find that single source of truth, but I found different things and other things. So I found out that there are great organizations and nonprofits and networks such as DNS who are actually dedicating the time to work on the topic. I also found a few individual stateless people, but what I was confused about was that I couldn't find the connection between all of those instances. So I felt like the knowledge was pretty much distributed and the information as well. So I felt like there's a gap between status people and their allies, meaning organizations and people working on the topic. And at some point, I simply decided to kind of close that gap by myself. And I decided in order to close that gap to build a platform that 
creates a connection between those people. So a platform and an online forum that creates a space for stateless people and their allies to talk, to share stories, to share experiences, and at some point um, support each other with solving the problem. The thing is that in order for this to work, there are different things required. So on the one hand, this platform needs to fulfill the digital and technical requirements to actually provide a safe space in which people can speak up without having to be scared that the information they share might leave the forum. That is something I'm working on. But then at the same time, stateless people actually need to reflect on how they can finally start speaking up for themselves and how they can finally start demanding what they need in order to improve their situation. So how much are they willing to share um, about their stories and experiences to at some point co-create the truth about what it means at the moment to be stateless. But above all of that also, the government actually needs to work on creating a society in which the stateless pe person actually feels encouraged to share that information. We need to create an environment and a society in which stateless people don't have to think about using a fake name in order to protect their real identity. And for that, we need the commitment and um, the convincing statement from policymakers that we are actually not fighting against each other, but actually fighting together to solve this problem. So while I'm working on the platform and um, while I hope that stateless people are working on how they can finally speak up for themselves, I hope that the government can work on how to not just give the commitment, but actually act on the commitment to help in solving this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for all of your excellent work. So next, I'm delighted to introduce Remzi. Remzi Medic is president of the Center for Roma Development, um, Center for Development of Roma Community, sorry, Bayerska Svetlina in North Macedonia. Remzi has over 20 years experience in the NGO sector working with and for the Romani community. So Remzi, if you're there, you can switch on your camera and join us. Thanks, Remedy. Over to you. I will uh, say that it's my pleasure to be presenter in this webinar, thanks to ENS. And I will give briefly the situation of Roma in North Macedonia. Uh, the Roma community of uh, Macedonia from the beginning of the 19 crisis is most affected when uh, uh, during that COVID-19 crisis. When we uh, have a quarantine measure was uh, introduced in North Macedonia, all possibility uh, existence uh, for the Roma were closed. For example, collecting waste, selling in the market, agricultural work, etc. It's closer to the Roma community. Roma were in the first place uh, for this mission in North Macedonia. Uh, if you see analyze from the uh, people who are, are non-employment. In, in the Roma community, this percent is in high level. This, I will tell about this for the people who are with documents and with citizenship. How, uh, you can imagine how is with the people with our documents and uh, uh, citizenships. Uh, we are uh, facing with the people on the field. And they, these people can use measure from the government. They can use the uh, help. Children of these people can need not be in the uh, education system. Everything is closed for these people. This is the, uh, the just some point 
to thinking about that. We are, uh, with my organization, we are every day on the field. And we facing with the sadness in their eyes from these people. Also, I will tell that that is also happiness in the eyes of the children when they uh, rejoice something. Even is that mask uh, uh, that for disinfection? They have uh, like a happiness. Can you imagine? Is that when we give some food for these people? How is this happiness for these people? I will give some point also. Shame on the government on in North Macedonia that aspire to be part of European Union. In period when uh, some some looking for water on the moon, we have Roma settlements without access to water. In this period, in COVID-19 crisis, we have not water. There is still to uh, speak a lot uh, to these uh, people and how they are facing with the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, not only in the COVID-19 crisis, before it was also uh, like this. And to have time for another present. I will stop here, but I will give only just uh, less emphasis. Integration is not a process to uh, put in the book or some documents. If we want together to be integrated Roma, we must to work together and to make the Roma be part of the integration. Give him to the Roma if you want to be part of the integration process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your fantastic work that you're doing in the community and for your wise words. Um, integration is not just a process on paper, but we have to work hard together to achieve it. Thank you, Ramzi. So our, our next speaker I'm delighted to welcome is Yonas Mohammadi. Yonas is the director of Greek Forum of Refugees, um, doing fantastic work in Greece with refugee-led communities and organizations to address what are really challenging um, circumstances in Greece at the moment. So Yonas, um, if you're there, you can switch on your camera. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us and including our voice also in this important uh, discussion. I'm representing GFR. GFR is an association and network of refugee communities and individuals. And it has been established actually by refugees and groups of asylum seekers themselves. Uh, uh, and me, myself, I'm uh, with refugee background from Afghanistan uh, and living in Greece more than uh, 19 years, close to 20 years. Uh, the issue of statelessness, statelessness is a, a huge issue and, and really a problematic issue that has been overlooked by uh, not just by, by states and governments and also most of the time by uh, organizations also working on the ground. I think generally the raising awareness and the information on the issue of statelessness or advocacy in order to be determined uh, statelessness as a status, I think it, it, is, it, it has been on the ground for a long time. It is uh, a problem. As Chris mentioned uh, very well that the issue of identification, it is not uh, uh, also uh, only the issue of identification and also pre-identification, it is the issue of raising awareness. Most of the time that we are facing people that they are coming, uh, they are entering Greece and even they don't know if they are stateless or they don't know what is their right as a stateless. 
because actually even the authorities they don't know even the people that they are uh, managing and coming uh, in touch with them they don't know what is led, what is stateless statelessness of course in last few years there has been uh, uh, really some important steps has been taken by by some uh, governments uh, no, but still there are issues and and uh, uh, i we should also mention that uh, the role of ens how important it has been um, on the raising awareness and also on advocacy uh, through uh, uh, all the workshops that they are doing in different countries especially here in greece that we have done uh, these workshops with ens uh, raising awareness to the refugee communities what is uh, statelessness and also uh, meeting and discussions uh, with uh, uh, organizations and authorities that uh, uh, that these are uh, really uh, important steps that has been taken and we are really uh, um, uh, thankful of that. Um, I think uh, um, we should, uh, uh, in terms of uh, recommendation by our uh, uh, by us by as communities and peoples uh, uh, concerned. Or affected by uh, uh, by statelessness, uh, it is the issue. Uh, the first, it is the termination of statelessness. I think by, by authorities as a status, it is the most important. That it should be uh, uh, determined this as a state as a status very well in every uh, uh, countries. Um, uh, of course, uh, there is in terms of regulation. If you see. Uh, there are some individuals that has been recognized as 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 a status of uh, statelessness, and me that I'm involved with refugees and uh, asylum seekers here in Greece for this more than 19 years that I'm here. I'm involved in this issue. I have seen just three cases that has been recognized as statelessness here in Greece, asylum seekers, I mean. So you know that how many people that they are coming from different countries here in Greece, from uh, uh, the, from Palestine, from uh, Lebanon, from Iran, and from uh, other countries, African countries that they are coming. But you see that this, these cases are really uh, very less. So we should not forget and we should, we should understand that there is an issue uh, on the ground. Uh, in terms of uh, um, next step, also I think we should force the issue of raising awareness and these workshops uh, to the organizations that they are uh, working with uh, uh, with newcomers, with establish with asylum seekers and refugees in order to uh, raise awareness and inform people. Uh, affected by statelessness, it is the, uh, the most important uh, uh, issue. And also to not forget also the issue of uh, 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 regularization routes. Uh, I think uh, uh, regularization it itself it, it is a big issue and it is problematic in uh, for for all migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers in every uh, European country. But uh, for stateless people, it is it is more uh, uh, problematic. I think the, the, the regularization and the rules for uh, uh, for citizenship for statelessness there should be uh, some uh, I can say some exceptions for them because they cannot have some papers that it is needed for regularization. For example, here in Greece, if you want to ask for citizenship, if you want to apply for citizenship, you should have a birth certificate. You should have a confirmation of your identity from from some countries that states people they don't have. It means that if there is not a change on these rules and regularizations, I think this issue will affect generations and generations, and it should it would be. Uh, uh, a problem that it is getting bigger and bigger, and it will affect all the uh, all the society. And when we come to different crises, to, to see different crises, because I heard about uh, the COVID-19 crisis, I think different crises, in different crises that we had or we will have in uh, societies, most of the time we, we understand that the most vulnerable people and invisible people, they are, they are most affected and they are the most vulnerable among the vulnerable groups and it is the statelessness and the stateless people that they are the most vulnerable and invisible groups among this large group of vulnerables which is asylum seekers which is refugees migrants roma and others i hope that this in these discussions and next steps that that will be taken by ens or by authorities in every country in european level I think that they should take this uh, in, 
uh, in the discussions and they should include people affected by statelessness uh, in their discussion, especially in, in, uh, in decision making procedures, which is, which is uh, uh, most important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Ian, for all the fantastic work that you're doing and for highlighting some of the specific challenges that stateless people in the refugee context um, face in Greece. So now I would like to welcome Lynn. Lynn is a statelessness activist and she's an individual ENS member based in Sweden. Lynn, over to you. Hi, thanks, thanks Nina. Um, I would like to do some comments first about uh, Christiana's work. I think it's uh, it's an amazing work that a stateless person that is <laughs> like struggling every day that actually live like a normal human being to live her life like or talking about myself as well um, just as a regular person but at the same time you know that this issue will follow you no matter where you go so you did an action on it so it's this is really appreciated from all the fellow stateless people. Um, so about myself, I'm like an individual activist when it comes to statelessness. Being a stateless person, I'd like to describe myself as a life sample. I do work with some NGOs in Sweden and um, um, UNHCR and such uh, campaigns. Uh, just to be there as the person that is this issue revolves around or like a sample like you can hear from organizations all the time about an issue but it's different to actually see it from a personal perspective and um, one of these NGOs that just started recently in Sweden is the Swedish organization against statelessness and is specified to raise awareness about statelessness in Europe and specifically in Sweden, then this, this issue is really not that popular here. And Sweden is a huge country when it comes to migration and asylum. And unfortunately, recently, the, their new laws, it's just getting worse and worse. And um, yeah, they had like a very negative uh, answer for statelessness determination procedures, um, which uh, kind of feels it uh, brings hopes down but it's nice to be around such organizations that trying to pressure on the governments on the state to actually see the status people and hear from them personally not just write about them not just treat them as numbers or as an issue that we need to solve no it's really people that have an opinion about this that might actually have a solution for it that the solution might be much easier than people think it is it's just like a nationality. I mean, here in Sweden, there are still kids that are born stateless just because of their nationality laws and their um, temporary resident impairment. And it's all a loop that it's get like these people are getting affected by it day by day. And now it's like everyone is talking about with the uh, COVID-19 just getting worse. Um, so, um, so basically, I'm working as an individual, but I know that there's a lot of people here as well in Sweden and in Europe trying to um, highlight this issue. And um, I think, like as Christiana said, um, it is important for like we as stateless people as well to have like a base where we are together and we know better about this issue. So. It would be nice if through other organizations that our voice can be heard because one person can do a difference, but all together with the help with people that have some power and have a stage for us to talk that we can actually make this issue disappear. And I don't think it's that hard. I really don't think so. So, um, yeah, I just hope, like especially in Sweden, they really lack a lot of education and information about statelessness. Um, I just hope that more countries in Europe will just educate at least their officers about what statelessness is and how to avoid making these people live in the limbo just for the lack of information. And it's like a hell on earth limbo just to be, you can't stay, you can't go just because you don't belong anywhere. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing your own experience and for 
um, for challenging us all to, to listen and to work more collaboratively with people directly affected by statelessness. So I want to thank all four of our speakers, Christiana, Remzi, Yunus and Lynn for sharing your, your insights and experience. It's always a privilege to share a platform with you and hear about the great work that you're all doing and, and learn from, from your expertise. Now we're going to turn to our representatives of European institutions to respond to, to what we've uh, heard from our speakers so far, to outline the respective roles of their institutions and tell us a bit more about what they're doing and what more should be done perhaps to address statelessness in Europe. So first of all, I'm delighted to introduce Tineka Strick who is an MEP from the Dutch Green Links Party and a member of the Green Group in the European Parliament. So Tineka, if you're there, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Nina and Chris, for organizing this and also for creating a platform uh, for stateless people and also for your work in promoting the rights of stateless people. I think that um, we have all uh, been impressed by uh, uh, the film, but also by the presentations that we just heard, especially from Mr. Bucalo and Katip on how huge the impact is on the personal life uh, of people uh, who are stateless. I mean, the feeling of non being non-existent, of uh, uh, that, that you're ignored by everyone, and that you uh, are in a limbo situation which really hampers you from living the life as you want. You're not recognized, you're not seen as an, as an identity. And, and, and that really shows how much work still needs to be done also within the EU, of course. Within the EU, the problem is also still huge. Um, in terms of numbers, uh, Chris already said uh, more than half a million in, in Europe. If you look in the U EU, in Latvia, for instance, we have more than 2,000 people uh, without a nationality, 70,000 in Estonia, and we also see that many Romani people uh, are, um, uh, don't have access to citizenship. Um, it's not the first time that we deal within the EU with this uh, issue. A few years ago, uh, the Libe Committee uh, um, uh, asked for a study of uh, uh, the European Parliament on the problem issues uh, surrounding statelessness. And one of the uh, recommendations uh, that came from this study was that there should be uh, an EU directive on statelessness, especially uh, with the view to uh, come up with norms and standards on uh, an obligation, of course, for a statelessness determination uh, procedure. Uh, also with norms on, on the burden of proof, as we also heard from different speakers that this is really uh, uh, causing a lot of difficulties, not only a lack of awareness, but also uh, that the burden of proof is so high that people cannot enter in, in, in such a procedure in order to get their rights established. But this is only the first step, of course, because uh, you can get a recognition of being statelessness, but it still doesn't solve all the problems. Uh, we know that access to citizenship, that naturalization is key for inclusion, for integration uh, in the state where, where you live. Um, and this is uh, causing a lot of well, institutional or legal problems uh, uh, that, that, that makes it difficult to solve this issue at the EU level. Member states are very sensitive. They say nationality is, is our sovereignty. It, it's not uh, up to the EU to, to, uh, to uh, come up with, to impose obligations on our nationality laws. But actually now we have uh, um, gained union citizenship which is really an EU competence, this uh, debate has really changed. I mean, we saw the Court of Justice in the Rotman case and also other judgment uh, imposes clear obligations to the EU, to member states if it comes to deprivation of citizenship. It says, then you deprive uh, a, people, a person from EU citizenship and that means you need to act 
in accordance with, for instance, the proportionality principle. So states are not free anymore to uh, decide on, on, on who to deprive uh, nationality. And then it, the question comes in, are they still free to uh, decide on their own uh, who they are going to, uh, um, to give the nationality? So the rules on acquisition of nationality, is this still a national competence or not? I think this, uh, um, because of the union citizenship, uh, it has its limits. Also, if, if you um, uh, argue that also the, the, um, the conventions, the UN conventions, uh, that uh, in order to facilitate and to prevent, uh, to facilitate nationality and to prevent statelessness, makes clear that uh, um, member states need to be uh, uh, um, obliged to, to, uh, to make sure that statelessness uh, is avoided and is prevented. And that means that they should uh, open up their nationality laws in order to, to uh, give them access to citizenship. Um, we are still working on that. I think that within the Libre Committee, there is, um, well, to a certain extent, uh, a lot of support for uh, going further on this direction so that the European Commission makes serious work of uh, uh, rules and of compliance with the rules on deprivation of citizenship and uh, also to, um, uh, to promote uh, also standards on acquisition of citizenship. Especially if you look at it from a lens of integration, that nationality is key to that. The Commission should do more and it's us for members of the European Parliament to uh, put pressure on the Commission to do so. Especially regarding children, of course we have a charter, uh, which uh, the Charter on Fundamental Rights which obliges member states to act uh, uh, in a way that uh, the best interests of the child are the primary uh, consideration. Uh, and here we also see that uh, um, last year in November, the European Parliament adopted a resolution uh, on uh, child's rights and there also uh, there was a paragraph on stateless children uh, uh, imposing or, or urging the Commission and the member states to make sure that there is access to, on the one hand, statelessness uh, uh, determination procedures, but also to make sure that uh, um, statelessness is uh, being uh, reduced. Uh, we also, so what Chris also said was that uh, um, there's also, uh, it comes along with discrimination. We saw with the Romani people, for instance, that they are discriminated against, that they are excluded. Last week we had a resolution in the European Parliament uh, that calls on the European Commission to come up with a legislative, so a binding instrument to combat and to, uh, um, to stop discrimination of Romani people and other minorities. And we will uh, ensure that once there is this legislative proposal that access to citizenship uh, is part of that uh, instrument. Um, and I think if it comes to human dignity, which is also part of our Charter of Fundamental Rights, that is really at stake uh, if it comes to statelessness. Um, and in that sense, I really think uh, that um, uh, also the return policies and access to basic needs for undocumented people should be strengthened at the EU level. I'm a rapporteur for the Returns Directive, and I've tabled amendments to make sure that uh, everyone, including those who do not have a legal status, have a, a, a proper access to basic needs and that uh, member states really make serious work of regularizing people in limbo situation, in undocumented situations. And I really hope I will get sufficient support within the European Parliament and from the member states. Um, there was a reference made to the new pact proposals. We will see tomorrow what, what, uh, what's in there. But uh, as was already said by uh, Mr. Mohammed, that indeed in the asylum procedure it's so important that there's sufficient awareness that not everyone has a nationality and that uh, officials are really uh, uh, um, skilled, that they have the expertise on that and that there's a proper uh, procedure making sure that people who ask for asylum 
are being identified and uh, that their uh, undocumented situation, the stateless situation, is being taken into account sufficiently. Um, so we have to see, at least for us, it's a really important uh, focus that we will have when we study and uh, assess and, and come up with our own ideas uh, in the negotiations on the new pact. Um, and we're very open to concrete ideas from your side, of course. And um, as uh, we will have here, the Council of Europe representative after me, I would just uh, make a remark in the end on uh, my work as a rapporteur on deprivation of citizenship when I was in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Uh, last year, for the Council of Europe, I, um, a report of me, a resolution was adopted uh, on deprivation of citizenship. I called for, um, uh, for more compliance with, uh, with international law and, um, and European standards on deprivation uh, policies, but I also urged the Committee of Ministers to come up with a comparative study because we need more facts on how member states deal with this uh, problem. Was, what was already said in the beginning by Mr. Bocola, it's very fragmented at the moment, the whole policies regarding statelessness, acquisition of nationality, deprivation of nationality. So uh, we need to have more facts on the table and then uh, the Committee of Ministers could come up with more recommendations and monitoring on how uh, states deal with that. And the reply of the Committee of Ministers was very positive, actually saying, uh, it's true, we see a, a gap, and we think indeed a comparative study should be conducted. So I really hope that not only within the EU, but also the Council of Europe will uh, uh, continue its work on uh, uh, promoting uh, and, and improving the situation uh, of stateless people. And I hope in the end that the Council of Europe and the European Union will really uh, cooperate in a fruitful way in that regard. Thanks a lot. For the Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for all the work you're doing to champion the rights of stateless people um, in the Parliament. So I'm delighted now to introduce our final speaker, who is Christoph Parel. Christoph is the director of the Human Rights Directorate at the Council of Europe. Over to you, Christoph. Well, um, thank you very much, Dina. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank Chris Nash for his invitation and congratulate him and his team for organizing this, this important event despite the difficulties caused by the pandemic. I think it's a very, very timely initiative. Chris, you said in your initial intervention that uh, the eradication of statelessness should be a priority, and I fully concur with you, like everyone before. I must say that for us, the Council of Europe, the, um, the prevention and, and, and reduction of statelessness is indeed a priority. Um, I think there's no need for me to reiterate the various causes, but more importantly, the very serious difficulties that are faced by stateless people. I, I heard very attentively to the testimonies in the initial video and I noted the very strong words that were used by some of the participants where they were saying that when you are a stateless person, and I quote them, you, you, you are nothing. You are dead, even someone said, and uh, you are a non-person. So I think, including for myself, working in a European institution, I think it was very good to be reminded by those presentations about indeed the need to eradicate statelessness. Um, talking from the perspective of the Council of Europe, I should say that stateless people in Europe are not totally deprived of uh, protection because the 47 member states of the Council of Europe have committed themselves to uh, secure to everyone under their jurisdiction, every, every person living on their territory. So they've committed themselves to ensure that everyone on their territory enjoys the basic rights that are provided for in the European Convention on Human Rights. So um, stateless people, including them, enjoy all these basic rights being the right to freedom of circulation, the right to freedom of expression and information, the right to assembly, the right to peaceful assembly and so on. Um, that implies in particular, and, and somebody referred to the notion of a dignity, 
that um, these people have the right to be treated indeed with uh, respect and dignity and on an equal footing. It is true, I must say, that the European Convention on Human Rights does not expressly mention as such a right to nationality. But the European Court of Human Rights, which is the tribunal which uh, supervises the implementation of the Convention by the state parties to the Convention, I must say, pays particular attention to this issue within the framework of Article 10.8 of the Convention on the right to respect to privacy and family life. And if I may give one example, in 2011, the court ruled that the right of access to a nationality constitutes part of a person's social identity. Um, through its, its various bodies, the Council of Europe has been working, I must say, for many years on the issue of access to nationality and the prevention of a statelessness. I think the most important and significant achievement is certainly the 1997 European Convention on Nationality, which stipulates specifically that everyone has the right to nationality, that statelessness must be avoided, and that no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of their nationality. Um, this convention is complemented by other instruments, and I would like to quote another convention, which is the 2006 Convention on the Prevention of Statelessness in Relation to State Succession. And, and I, I would like at, at this point to repeat the invitation that I make every time I'm attending an event dealing with statelessness, which is to call on all states which have not yet done so to, to ratify these two conventions. And for those states who have already ratified the conventions to withdraw any reservations that they may, may have made um, to these instruments, um, bearing in mind the, the purpose of the conventions. Um, in addition to its standard setting activities, its normative activities, many institutions of the Council of Europe are working on the issue. Mr. Strick just now mentioned the Parliamentary Assembly resolution on the need to eradicate selflessness of children. But I, I can also mention, for example, the work done by our Commissioner for Human Rights, or our special representative of the Secretary General on the migrants and refugees, and, uh, and also other bodies, in particular our intergovernmental committees. At the moment, we see clearly the implications of situations such as the ongoing migrant crisis, which ha has left many people at risk of statelessness, and also the COVID-19 pandemic, which was already mentioned by some participants, which has clearly aggravated a stateless individual's lack of access to health, housing and education, and to register birth in isolated settlements. These are certainly very serious issues that need to be addressed. So the Council of Europe is very conscious, I must say, of the need to strengthen the protection of human rights and ensure in particular the effective enjoyment of basic rights by the most vulnerable, including, of course, those faced with nationality and statelessness issues uh, and we are willing to play our full part in this in this endeavor um, i would like perhaps briefly to touch upon the question of refugees and migrants to say that um, we adopted a couple of years ago an action plan on protecting refugee and migrant children for the period 2017-2019 uh, to ensure in particular that every child has a nationality now work is underway to follow up on the results achieved with a view to addressing statelessness in the framework of a new action plan. This new action plan will focus on access to justice, which is uh, an essential component of a respect for human rights, of course, and the rule of law. And the objective will be to promote the legal empowerment of a refugees and migrants in vulnerable situations, including stateless persons, through the provision of information, legal aid, and legal representation. Um, at the intergovernmental level, which was mentioned again by Mrs. Strick, our European Committee on Legal Cooperation has carried out a detailed analysis of current practices and challenges regarding the avoidance and reduction of statelessness in Europe. So, Mrs. Strick, I would hope that this analysis, in a way, we would response to your appeal for a, uh, a review, an overview of the situation. 
As a follow-up, I must say the, the committee, the CDCJ, agreed to organize a, an international conference on statelessness to raise awareness and also to promote implementation of the Council of Europe standards in this field. So, like everyone, we were affected by the pandemic and uh, in the organization of our activities, but we very much hope that we will be able to organize this international conference next year. That conference, I must say, should be supplemented by a series of uh, technical meetings on targeted statelessness issues. And to give some ideas, the, these technical meetings might include topical questions such as the situation of a recent migrants in Europe with roots in certain states or regions outside Europe, for instance, refugees coming from the Middle East and their children, or the situation of children born to parents who joined a jihad and left the country. So the Council of Europe is, a, is really willing and ready to support its member states to help establish, uh, or where appropriate, improve the functioning of statelessness determination procedures, strengthen the protection of these persons, and enable them to access their rights, including the right to acquire a nationality in particular for children. Um, to conclude, I should say that the, the issues and challenges uh, raised by testlessness should be taken forward in close partnership with all relevant actors. Lina, you mentioned the need to work all together. Uh, I would fully sympathize with uh, that statement and also with the testimonies of, that were made by the different speakers. We need to gather um, all actors, international organizations, the, at the European level, the European Union and the Council of Europe, but also at the international level. I noted on the chat that there are representatives of the UNHCR, so clearly we need also to work together with the UN, the UNHCR, but also with governments, clearly, and representatives of civil society, um, NGOs, and uh, focus on the proper implementation of the existing standards first. I think that is really the, 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 the basis, I would say, for any future work. And, and to conclude, I should say that uh, the statelessness index that has been developed by ENS is really to be welcomed and for us remains an important tool to help governments and institutions like the Council of Europe to monitor uh, the situation and make progress in addressing uh, statelessness across Europe. So thank you very much again for this uh, very good and uh, very timely event. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, I'm going to ask you to, to leave your camera on just for a moment and for Taneka, if you wouldn't mind to turn yours on just now as well. So we, we don't really have time for questions, unfortunately, and we've we've come over time now by two minutes. But if people will bear with us and if you're able to stay just for five, ten minutes longer, our speakers, um, I would like to just give the floor back to each of you in turn, including our four previous um, speakers, just to say, um, reflect uh, a final few words of reflection in, in maximum one minute, if you can. Um, and perhaps for Christoph and Teneka, if you can tell us um, one thing that you're taking away from the webinar today and what you're going to do with that in the next six months. Um, and then I'll turn to our other four speakers. So maybe first to you, Teneka, if you don't mind, just a minute, if you can. And then I'll come to you, Christoph. Thanks. Yeah, the, this conference really makes clear how urgent uh, the problem is and that we need to make sure that uh, well, we cannot have an integration policy or inclusion uh, without the right and access to citizenship. So what I would um, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, aiming to do is on the one hand urge the Commission to come up with clear um, uh, guidelines for member states on acquisition of uh, uh, acquisition of nationality um, and also standards and recommendations on uh, how they deal with deprivation of nationality but I will also um, uh, try to seek support for, for an EU directive on uh, statelessness uh, determination procedures and maybe in that uh, pro while uh, promoting that and, and, and getting a resolution on that, uh, we could also try to get clear position from the European Parliament 
that this access to the citizenship should be uh, granted by the member states, even though it is a uh, national competence. And uh, maybe one last final remark. I mean, the European Parliament adopts a lot of resolutions, but Van der Leyen, the president of the Commission last year, uh, promised that if we would come up with legislative initiatives, she would take it on board and she would develop it as uh, an initiative for legislation, because we lack this uh, possibility ourselves. So I really hope to get sufficient support to develop such an initiative uh, by the European Parliament. Thank you very much, Taneka. Thank you for that. Um, Christoph, any final reflections or one thing that you're taking away from today? Well, what I will take away are clearly the, the testimonies that we heard during the video and the presentations by your members. I think they were, I think they, they were very telling. They, they summarized very well the problems that are faced by stateless people in Europe. So, I think it was a very good reminder, especially for people like me, because, you know, we work in offices and comfortably, and sometimes we are a bit distant from the reality of the situation of uh, stateless people. So I, I, I keep that definitely in mind. Uh, for, and for, for, for me, I must say, it's a, an incitement and an encouragement to, to work further on the issue, because uh, it's not acceptable that nowadays there's still half a million people in Europe who are deprived of uh, very basic rights. So I will keep that in, in, in memory. I, I, I mean, our organization is still a small organization, so don't expect us to solve the issues alone. As I said, we need clearly to work together. And I saw that th there was one question by Fedi about whether the European Court of Human Rights has issued a, a specific fact sheet on the deprivation of a citizenship. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure, Fedir, but I will check on the website of the code. And if that is the case, if it exists, I will forward it to colleagues in the NS Secretariat, and I'm sure they will be able to forward it to you. But uh, many thanks again uh, for that for that event. That was great. Reflections. Um, I'll ask you to turn off your cameras. Thank you. And I'm going to give the floor very briefly, just for a minute each uh, maximum, to each of our um, speakers, our members. So, Christiana, would you like to come in with a final reflection? Any recommendation, words of wisdom? What would you like to say to everyone? Um, yeah. So, first of all, I want to say thank you definitely for this opportunity of getting to talk to such a large audience. Um, that's very helpful. Um, obviously, listening to all of those interventions is overwhelming and it makes obvious once again how much problems we still have and what we have to solve. But I just hope that while working on the big problems, I hope that we don't neglect the things we can maybe solve right away. Being stateless can be very lonely and working on statelessness, I guess, is also not a too crowded um, industry or an area to work in. So I hope that people start working on actually building community and creating a sense of belonging. Um, yes, the platform isn't launched yet, but we have a landing page already online. So for those of you who are interested, um, please feel encouraged to sign up. Um, I will share the link in the chat in a second. Thank, Thank you, you, Christiana. Thank you very much. Uh, Ramsey, would you like to... Give us a few final words of wisdom, say something. Are you still there, Ramsey? I think we may have lost Ramsey, so I might come to Eunice first, and then we'll try you again, Ramsey, in a moment. Eunice, would you like to give us a final words of wisdom or reflection? Yeah. Hopeful that uh, when I hear from uh, the director of the Human Rights of Council of Europe that says that the reduction of statelessness is a priority for, uh, uh, for, for the Council of Europe, and also from a uh, respective uh, MEP that uh, uh, said that uh, 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 especially the issue of undocumented children and also citizenship. It is, it is something that there are uh, directives and works from the European Parliament. What is so important for me is the follow-up of all these willing and uh, works and directives that are being done and at the central point, it means that the European Council or the European Parliament or Commission 
there should be a mechanism of follow up for uh, the, for the member states in order to be implemented. I think it is uh, it is so important. So the connection of grassroots with decision making process and decision making uh, decision makers, I think it is uh, it is the most important. Thank you. Thank very you much. very much, Yunus. We'll try once more for Remzi. Are you there? Are you there, Ramsey? I think we've lost him. Sorry about that, Ramsey. So um, last but not least, Lynn, would you like to give us a few final words of wisdom? Um, yeah. Uh, I don't have much to say but just to talk about how important the rate of nationality is that I provide all other rates actually based on. And um, I think this is a long journey to work on, but I think maybe we are on the like one step in the right direction. And maybe it's time to give people this right so they can have the right to choose as well. A person with nationality can choose whoever they want to be or wherever they want to go. So people don't feel that they're handicapped by their lack of papers or nationality anymore. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you very much. And on that note, um, I, I really want to thank all of our speakers uh, for taking the time to share their insights and expertise. You've given us a lot of food for thought to take away and reflect on. Thank you to the over 180 people who joined us and more than 120 who've hung on to hear the final reflections um, from all corners of the world. I saw people dialing in from India, from Myanmar, from Ukraine, from Dominican Republic. It's fantastic to see um, the global statelessness community coming to, to support this webinar. So Spanish speakers, don't forget that you can sign up for the remaining webinars in the series hosted by Fundación Cepaim on statelessness in Spain and the registration link is in the chat. For English speakers, there's uh, also a link um, hopefully going to be put in the chat to a webinar hosted by our friends at the Global Campaign for Equal Nationality Rights, which is taking place tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. UK time. Uh, don't miss that. Uh, in the meantime, our work with our members across Europe continues to ensure that people affected by statelessness are part of the debate and response to the complex challenges of our time. As part of this, we're launching today an exciting new stateless photography project, um, inviting stateless people, formerly stateless, and people from communities significantly impacted by statelessness to help us build a stock of images representing experiences of statelessness um, for a collection that will be called Expanding the Frame. The deadline for submissions is 31st of October, and you can find out more about this exciting new project at the link in the chat, um, which is there now. So for now, thank you for bearing with us. Have a great day, stay safe, and goodbye. <laughs>